All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, this is going to be a bit of an unusual posting on my channel. Um, most of my videos, as you know, are about the financial system and gold. And I did a video maybe a, a couple weeks ago that uh, gave a few of my thoughts about Bitcoin, and it raised quite a bit of interest, um, <laughs> it raised quite a bit of criticism as well. And so what I agreed to do was to take some questions from people and bring on a very good friend of mine who's a, what I consider to be a Bitcoin expert. He's been involved in Bitcoin for many years, um, I'd say going back into uh, the 2000s, actually the late 2000s. And uh, I've, known, I've known this guy, his name's Jared, for I'd say at least 15 years, wouldn't you say, Jared? That sounds about right to me. Okay, so this this may or may not be a single part series and uh, shouldn't be taken from uh, anybody who subscribes to my channel was me endorsing Bitcoin. Um, what I wanted to do, though, was to have an intelligent conversation about it, um, because I think everybody that subscribes to my channel is, has a concern about the current financial system and having an intelligent discussion about all of the alternatives is uh, really what this channel was all about. So at least if we have uh, some experts uh, having back and forth discussions about you know, gold and Bitcoin, I think everybody is going to be well served. Um, so with that said, um, you know, Jared, is there anything uh, you wanted to discuss before I get into the questions? Uh, not that I can think of. I mean, I've been in the technology field for more than 20 years now. So my, my initial start in Bitcoin was attracted to the technology side as much to the financial side. And I know I've, I've learned a lot from you over the years. The petrodollar video you did at one point was one I gave away to people that were asking about that system. So I kind of slid into the economic side of this from the technology side. OK, OK, good. Well, I have a number of questions and you know, th these questions can lead to, I think, some significant conversation. Um, what I did was I did my best to collect all of the questions that were asked and uh, not take them verbatim because quite a few of them were of uh, you know, a similar vein. So what I did was I tried to capture their main essence and distill them into, I think, some meaningful questions that can lead to some good conversation on our part. So uh, any subscribers, you know, if you don't hear your question asked, uh, please know that uh, you know, your question has been reviewed and it's been put into uh, one of the categories that we're going to discuss. OK, so uh, let's let's get started. So I'd like to start with, I think, uh, one of the most important questions, which is, what are the characteristics of a good reserve asset? Um, what are the characteristics of a good currency? And in this regard, what are the strengths and weaknesses of gold and uh, Bitcoin for both? So Jared, I'll let you get started. So uh, initially, I think a lot of people misinterpreted the way the original white paper talked about digital cash, because everyone seems to equate cash and currency and money as the same thing. And uh, if you read any of Satoshi's writings in the forums, he was primarily talking about a replacement for, or not even a replacement for, but some a way to recreate gold in the digital space. What he saw as he saw cash as money and not as currency. So we kind of, that's kind of been shifted over the years to where Bitcoin won't ever make good currency. And to this day, it doesn't. And, but to me, one of the primary reasons for that isn't that the technology hasn't gotten better. It's that government regulation is very much opposed to using anything other than your local fiat currency as, as currency. Okay. Okay. Do you have anything more you wanted to say about that? Because I think that, uh, you know, you talked a little bit before the show about, you know, de minimis uh, exceptions and, and whatnot. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So if you want to think about it, I've heard that from a lot of people is that in order for Bitcoin to eventually become currency at some point, there would need to be a de minimis exception. So uh, <clears throat> when you look at the tax law right now, if I were to use Bitcoin to say buy a cup of coffee, uh, 
I would end up having to pay tax on the gain of that little tiny bit of Bitcoin, uh, which isn't in itself a, a hard thing to do monetarily. But then when you get to actually doing your taxes, I think uh, one of my favorite people in the Bitcoin space talked about how his tax, uh, his tax filing for the United States was over 200 pages long. And he did that as much to make a point as he did it because he likes using Bitcoin. But for most people, that's completely uh, outside of anything you would actually want to do to deal with your taxes on a year to year basis. Oh, fair, fair enough. And I know that we're going to talk a lot about privacy later because I know that, uh, you know, a lot of people that uh, buy gold and buy Bitcoin think that, uh, you know, maybe the government doesn't have, uh, you know, the legal right necessarily to collect taxes. And then, then it's up to them as to whether or not they need to report it. But I think that's uh, something we'll be discussing a little bit later. Um, okay. Well, I, I'd like to add to this, though, because, yeah. I think, uh, you know, the subscribers are asking about uh, gold as a result of so, and uh, so I'm going to ramble on a little bit here, and I'm going to talk first about banking and how reserves are uh, basically uh, defined by the legal system. So, you know, essentially, uh, when a company uh, has liabilities, uh, namely uh, assets that others can uh, demand, uh, such as demand deposits or certificates of deposits, any, any kind of liability that the banking system would have, they have to keep a certain amount of reserves on hand to make sure that they, they can honor their obligations. And there's something called uh, financial solvency, which means that you have sufficient uh, reserves in order to meet all of your obligations. And because of the banking, the way the banking system is set up, um, no bank is actually solvent uh, by the strict definition of the, the word, because all of the deposits are basically, you know, or at least most of the deposits are demand deposits and people are of the impression that they can just go to the bank anytime they want and, uh, you know, withdraw what they have on deposit. When the reality is that a certain percentage of it has been loaned out by the bank, you know, with a uh, particular term structure so that the bank can generate a rate of return and then pass along some interest to the depositor. And so only a certain amount of that money is available to honor that uh, obligation. And that's really what's called the reserve. You know, that's the strictest uh, definition. And where we got into trouble back in the uh, early 1930s was that too many people were trying to get their deposits out at the same time and the banks couldn't possibly honor it. So they faced a situation where their insolvency was actually going to turn into a, a bankruptcy. So, you know, being insolvent means that you don't have the funds to meet your obligations. Being bankrupt is you don't have the funds and you're being called upon to honor those obligations. And this is what led to the change in the banking structure in the early 1930s. So, you know, the, uh, we had the Gold Bullion Reserve Act and obviously the executive action by, uh, you know, FDR, which called in the gold and essentially made it so that um, the obligations of the bank couldn't be demanded in terms of gold, because while the, the banking system cre can create new Federal Reserve notes, they can't create new gold out of nothing to honor their obligations. And so, you know, fast forward to today, uh, a reserve is essentially whatever the obligations are denominated in. So if the uh, banking system owes Federal Reserve notes, then Federal Reserve notes are the reserve. It, you know, if a family owes money, uh, let's say they have a mortgage and the mortgage is denominated in dollars, then the family would be well served having some dollars in reserve to meet those obligations in the event that, for example, their salary were to be cut off. And uh, because otherwise, uh, if they have no salary, and they have no reserves, they have no way to meet the loan obligations, and then they'd be forced to seek bankruptcy protection. So how does this relate to gold? Um, you know, is gold a reserve of the banking system? And I would say that the answer strictly is no, it's not. 
And the reason for that is that the banks don't have any obligation in terms of gold. Um, but does the, federal, does the uh, federal government have an obligation in gold? And there I would say, historically, the answer is yes. And the reason goes back to the Gold Bullion Reserve Act of 1934, when they called in the gold and they changed the, um, basically the definition of the gold certificate and the Federal Reserve note, such that all of the gold that was uh, part of the Federal Reserve system that uh, was the asset of the people essentially uh, reverted over to the treasury. And so the treasury then maintained custodial ownership of all of the gold. And in return, they gave the Federal Reserve gold certificates, which represented claims on that gold that could not be exercised. They also defined that the Federal Reserve note uh, was then a first claim of the Federal Reserve system uh, on those gold certificates. And so we have uh, a system in place where neither the, the Federal Reserve notes cannot be demanded. Uh, in a, they, they cannot represent a demand upon the gold um, unless the system were to fail. But the laws are still in place such that if the system were to fail, the, the claims are still there. And so the gold is encumbered. So while gold is not a reserve in the banking system, gold is a reserve from the standpoint of the federal government because it still has obligations out there uh, that are denominated in gold. And in relation to, oh, sorry. Did that, did, I make, did that make sense? No, that made complete sense. And I think what you're seeing is, is kind of a reaction to that because we kind of live in this digital world now where everyone can do things through their computer. Uh, you can buy things, you can get them delivered. Uh, so I think where the difference came about is in order to use gold in a digital manner, you have to trust a counterparty. Like someone has to hold all the gold and do those certificates. And historically, this is kind of the thing that happened. And that was kind of what Bitcoin was designed to solve is to have a, a digital bearer asset like gold that in the digital space. And I think you're seeing kind of the reverse start to come into play because uh, banks and especially central banks have been completely... Uh, hostile towards Bitcoin. And the what's shifting now is that corporations and larger institutional entities are starting to realize, well, if this is a digital bearer asset, it confers us all these advantages of having a bearer asset that we can move anywhere in the world. So uh, for example, Michael Saylor, with, uh, whose company MicroStrategy just bought $450 million worth of Bitcoin back in September. Uh, his point was when he was looking at Bitcoin, he talked about the Argentinian peso crisis where he, his company operated out of Argentina and they wanted to get their money out of there when the peso crisis was happening. And they were sitting around in a room trying to figure out how to do it because they couldn't the capital controls, they weren't allowed to just move the money out through the banking system, and they weren't allowed to just buy gold and ship it out. So he even came up with the idea at the time of just, well, can we just buy a giant yacht and sail it to the Caribbean? And, you know, and his accountants looked at him like he was crazy, but he talked about, you know, if I had known about Bitcoin back then, that would have been my first choice because we can hold it as a bearer asset and then transfer it to any other place we have in the world. And there's at almost no cost. Well, that, that's interesting what you're saying. It's, uh, it sounds like um, the main utility of Bitcoin then is, you know, one to authenticate transactions without somebody, you know, necessarily holding all of the control over what constitutes, you know, a, a fair transaction. Um, but the, the other question then is you mentioned that it's a bearer asset and ordinarily a bearer asset uh, represents something, right? Yes. And in this case, the, the Bitcoin doesn't represent gold. You know, it doesn't represent federal reserve notes. 
So from that standpoint, it's just a, um, a transfer of something. Now, what that something is, I, I'm not 100% clear. That's, that's where 